And good morning. It's time now for Coach's Corner, live from McDonald's on Madison's Hilltop. I'm Tim Torrance. We do it every Saturday morning from the McDonald's across from the Madison High School. This morning, we're going to jump in and talk NCAA men's basketball. I've got the bracket expert, the bracketologist, if you will, Dave Almond. In. Good morning, Dave. Good morning, Tim. How are you? I'm nice to be back for another year. It is. What is this, our third year to do this? Is that right? I believe so. Third year to do this. We're talking NCAA men's basketball brackets. Um, <laughs> and I think we talk about it every year, and I, and I, I find it intriguing, and I, I was actually telling my wife this morning, she said, what are you talking about again? And I told her, and she said, hmm. And I said, you know what? It's interesting to know the thoughts of somebody that actually does this, follows this, understands it. I don't understand the seedings and how it goes for the most part, but it's interesting to see your thoughts and and and. But why why in the world would you do something like this? What got you interested? Well, I think first and foremost, Tim, you know, I'm a college basketball fan. Right. So that started way back in high school. And, and that's it, where it has to start. Exactly. <laughs> and then much like you just said, as you watch the tournament pairings come out on Selection Sunday and you're thinking, now how did that come together? Mm -hmm. How is it that this team is here and why would they be out there? Right. And how did they come up with these seed lines and all this stuff? And so just started that process of learning more about it. Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of taking my own hand at it and seeing, well, I wonder what I would come up with. And as resources became more available online and, and those types of things, it made it a little bit easier as some of the information, if you will, that the actual committee uses is is out there for, for, for folks to use and to find. And then it kind of got to a point where I did it for some friends, and then they encouraged me to take it the next step. And so I launched Bracketville in 2008, mm -hmm. um, which is the online website that I have. And then I got picked up by NBC in 2010 and been doing stuff with them ever since. And now we're at 2019, mm -hmm. and uh, here we are. You, you mentioned, and again, technology has come such a long way, but before the technology, how hard did it make it to do what you do? Very difficult, almost impossible, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, until some folks like Jerry Palm, who does some stuff for CBS, actually started replicating what used to be the old RPI, mm -hmm. or the Ratings Percentage Index. Um, so that was a tool that people could get to. He's a mathematician, or at least has that background, and, and replicated the formula. And you could subscribe to his site and um, basically have very similar information to what the NCAA committee was using, mm -hmm. at least one of their tools. Um, and so that made it a little bit easier. Yeah, but before that, it would pretty much be entirely guesswork because right. you would have no idea exactly. They might refer to the RPI, but what is that? Right. Then that became more readily available to people. And so for those of us, as I like to say, bracket geeks, um, you know, we kind of started taking that and then seeing how we could use some of those same tools and match ourselves up against, because the real challenge of this, if you will, and I tell people this when we have conversations, if it were Dave Amon's bracket, mm -hmm. it would be easy. Right. That's my bracket. There right. you go. That's sure. who I think should go. Right. The challenge, of course, is trying to figure out what the 10 men and women on the actual selection committee are going to do. And based on some history and some knowing how the process works, you try to make your best estimates and then see where you come out. And you talk about those folks on that committee, and that committee's not that far from here. Um, but this is not a process that starts today or it started yesterday. This is a process that goes for the entire season? Absolutely. Um, first thing we did, actually my work kind of started back in early October when practice got going. Mm -hmm. And then we come out with a preseason bracket, which is, you know, kind of ridiculous when you think about it. Right. But it's kind of like having a, a, a preseason poll. Mm -hmm. It's kind of based on what some teams have coming back from last year, some talent that they have coming in, and what are expectations. And then it evolves throughout the year. But yeah, it it's really is, and the committee has stressed this more so in recent years than maybe in the past, is they really value a team's entire body of work. In fact, for several years, there was a metric that they would refer to, maybe you remember, well, in their last 10 games, mm -hmm. or in their last 12 games. Well, technically, that's not a metric anymore. Now, 
each committee member can have his or her own opinion as to how they weigh mm -hmm. a team finishing the year versus starting the year. But if you look at a team's profile or their team sheet, it has all of their outcomes. And while the dates are there, and then put them into overtime or things like that, they're not put in order. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at a team's entire scope from beginning to end. And so a big win in November really carries the same weight as a big win in February or a bad loss or anything in between. It's, right. And it's a team's entire profile. And now that we've reached March, mm -hmm. You know, teams' profiles are about 85 to 90 percent complete, so we have a better understanding of where they are. And now we're down to, you know, a handful or two of teams that are really trying to figure out, you know, who those last teams are going to be in and, and which ones are going to miss. Yeah, it, and we'll get into this a, a little bit more detail later. But you talk about the bubble teams, the, the teams that eh, they may or may not make it, but. The thing is, you know, just kind of in simple terms, if you have an average season but win your conference tournament, certainly helps. <laughs> well, absolutely. You know, so the way this works is there's 32 automatic qualifiers mm -hmm. and 36 at-large bids to get to your field of 68. Um, this has one of those years that we're like, can't we just go back to 64? I'm not sure we really have 68 worthy teams, right. but there's going to be 36 at-large teams. Right. But to your point, the automatic qualifiers get the automatic bid, and every conference can decide that for themselves. But with the money involved, and let's just be honest, it's yeah. largely a, a money thing, right. they all have gone to the conference tournament, and so they have declared that the winner of our conference tournament will be the recipient of our league's automatic bid. Mm -hmm. So winning the regular season conference title gets you the top seed in the conference tournament, but it doesn't get you the automatic bid to the NCAA tournament. Right. Now, for the power conferences like the ACC, the Big Ten, the Big 12, it's really not as big of an issue unless you have a team that's sort of off the charts right. make a run and win because chances are the teams playing for the title at the end are both going to go it could potentially make a difference of a seed line but but that's really about it where it becomes more challenging is some of the conferences where now you have a team playing particularly like on a saturday or a sunday or even a friday who otherwise will not qualify as an at-large team, the only way they will go is by winning the league's automatic bid. And so if that happens, the committee has to prepare for that in advance. How are we going to handle this? And then when they're putting that final seed list together, at-large team number 36, if X team wins over here, now 36 is out. Right. 35 becomes the last team in because we have to take the automatic qualifier. Right. And so somebody gets bumped. We like to call those bid thieves, mm -hmm. um, you know, during championship week. Right. And I would in fully anticipate that we'll have another couple. It's pretty standard. Mm -hmm. um, and so when that happens, you don't want to be the last team in on Saturday with a bid thief playing Saturday night and Sunday. Right. And that, that, that was kind of to my point of how many teams steal a spot in the big dance from somebody else because uh, Podunk University at, at 500 on the season, they win their conference tournament and oop, all of a sudden, now they're in. So if they're in, somebody else has got to be out. Yeah, and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to bump somebody from their same conference because, and this is another thing for people to understand, teams are evaluated as a team on their own. Mm -hmm. They're not weighed by the fact that you play in the Big Ten or the Big 12 or the SEC sure. or the um, um, ACC or whatever. So although the opponents that they play are on there, it's not like, well, the ACC is going to get seven bids. No. There's going to be probably eight teams from the ACC make the tournament this year, right. but it's not because they're in the ACC. It's because their profile will be one of the 36 best. Because, right. you know, last year I think only four teams from the Big Ten made it. They had a, a down year by comparison. So somebody will get bumped, 
but there's no way to know in advance necessarily who's going to be until you get further along and they're in that committee room and they pretty much got their field determined mm -hmm. and now they're waiting for results to come in as they finish the seeding process and then starting putting the bracket together and what's going to happen if said team on Sunday wins right and sometimes they have to create two or three different brackets mm -hmm. before they're the one they're going to send to Turner and CBS to announce at six o'clock right because there's no time to redo it all so they may have three working brackets in play and then depending on the result this is the one that goes hey let's uh let's, let's talk about the 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 10 people that that are on this committee and first of all how, how how do they get on the committee well i don't know all of the inner workings tim but there's a selection process and so usually it's um athletic directors from conferences sometimes former coaches usually they hold a position within the university and then they're balanced out from around the country so they may come from the mountain west and the sec and the atlantic 10 and a smaller conference may be representative and so this group of men and women then actually follow the season they're try to get to as many different games as they can so they will travel a lot during the year they're set up with basically every TV channel network that they could find and so they're probably watching games on DVR they're watching games late at night because part of what they have to do is each of them will be assigned a certain number of conferences to monitor sure so all 32 conferences are accounted for and they'll be in contact with the coaches and the ADs and the SIDs because they'll give a report when they all convene because what they'll weigh is things like are there factors that the committee needs to be aware of such as a significant player missing two or three games but they're back right now they don't get credit for suspensions and things like that but an injury that could be accounted for potentially sure. uh, were there weird circumstances that happened at a game team a lost a close game on the road but they had mechanical problems with the plane they didn't right. get there till two hours before tip-off it kind of threw them off so those are all little things that you and I never really hear sure. about that those people will be responsible for reporting um, and then giving an assessment of the conference as to you know we believe this is probably a one-bit league which is most of your small conferences are um, and so, so that's kind of where they start um, and then all of them also will turn in an initial two lists uh, the first list that they turn in is a list of teams that they believe have already qualified to make the field they would call them locks or whatever to be at large right. they don't talk about conference champions because those are determined right. throughout the week right. so these would be teams on their list that we don't need to discuss as a group about their inclusion so if you're looking at teams this year it might be like a virginia a kentucky a duke north carolina they don't have to debate at this point whether those teams are going to make the field yeah. seating they, they will discuss later sure. And then the second list they'll turn in is a list of teams that they say should be, quote, under consideration. And those teams will go on an at-large board. And so all the votes come in, and if they have to appear on, I believe, on eight of the ten ballots, mm -hmm. then they will get locked in, or they will start on the at-large board. And so when they come in, there may be 18 to 20, 22 teams that are already in the field after the first day Right. when they turn in their initial ballots is this the same 10 folks that were on it last year or does it rotate off yeah there's a rotational basis i think they serve three to four year terms oh, wow. and so every year a couple of them rotate off and right. so there's a new chair every year mm -hmm. and usually someone works their way through the process they start right. as a ad hoc member and then you know they become uh, you know the vice chair and then the chair and then they go off right um so there's a process and and how that works well i would i would hope you would want to keep people on from year to year to kind of keep that mental process going because it seems like it's it's i don't want to say complicated but it's very complex yes it's very complex and we don't always agree or may see eye to eye and i think that's the other thing that's important to remember is i was fortunate enough to get to go through a mock process that the ncaa held a few years ago up yep. in indy and so you get to see that and understand how different committee members may view things differently so they might have two teams up projected with their team sheets and they're talking about these two teams mm -hmm. now it's also important to note like let's say for example 
um, the Big Ten commissioner, which is, I don't believe they are this year, is on the committee. Well, he or she would have to leave the room if they're talking about a Big Ten team. Right. They don't get to vote. They don't. So that's just so all pro impropriety or perception thereof is sure. is out the window. Right. So the committee will debate. And then that will go through a process, and it could be a heated debate, it could be different kinds of things back and forth, and then they take a vote that's private through their network on the computers, and the process in place to vote teams in goes, right. and it repeats itself over and over and over and over and over again. And so, you know, you could have three people that don't think and six that do, mm -hmm. and so, to, you know, how that process works, it it's a, really is a series of votes, and then right. eventually they get to the end where they're voting the last few teams in the field and then they begin the process of ranking them from one to 64. Right. You, you, uh, uh, we hear this every year and, and as, as a, as a men's basketball fan, when the, when the bracket comes out, uh, who are these? Well, it's, this is XYZ University. I've never heard of them. Where do they come from? Why are they in the tournament? Well, they have a, a 17 and 10 record. How do they make But there are teams that will come in and make it every year that essentially folks at some point will have never heard of. Well, absolutely. And a lot of them call uh, come from, you know, the small conferences. The but those conferences count. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, every conference, there's 32 of them now, gets a representative. Mm. And so whether that's the MEAC or the MAC or the Big South or the Atlantic Sun, or yeah. they're all going to have a rep. Right. And so they'll get seated in. Um, you know, and the way they do it now, I think most people are familiar, um, you know, the last four seeds, 65 to 68, are paired together and they play, quote, play-in games play in Dayton yeah, yeah. to be a 16 seed. Right. And then the, the last four at-larges get paired together in Dayton, mm -hmm. and then they will get slotted in to a spot. Usually it ends up being on the 11 or 12 line. Sometimes it could be a 10. I've seen it on the 13. but depending on who those teams are. Right. Um, so that's, they did that to add a couple of extra teams. Right. Um, and largely because the big conferences, quite frankly, didn't want to give up at large bids. Mm -hmm. So when they, when they used to have 30 conferences, now they have 32. And so they didn't want to give up the opportunity to get at large bids. So suddenly we ended up with a 68 team field and now we have to have play-ins to get down to a 64 team bracket. Wow. That's unbelievable. Dave, let's talk about, well, that's first, let's get into what you've got coming up next week. I know you're going to, you're going to have a little bit of a mock uh, situation coming up for folks that want to take part in it. Yeah, this is the third or fourth year I've done it. I, I thought it would be, you know, kind of fun because I know there's some other college basketball fans. And so it's kind of an opportunity for someone a little bit like what we've talked about today to get a little first-hand experience of what it would be like sure. if you were on the committee. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have tried to simulate that the best way that we can. We don't set up some elaborate computer network, and, <laughs> but, but we managed to make it work and we condense sure. it. The first year I did it in about three hours on an evening. That was really kind of rough to try to, you know, right. put five days into three hours. Right. Um, but we're also respectful of everybody's time. So we're going to do it on a week. Actually, it's a little later this year. We're going to do it next Saturday on the 9th. Mm -hmm. um, probably start around 9 and finish up around 5. But we'll take that time and let them come out and actually produce their own bracket. Oh, wow. Go through the process and see see what they come up with. And I do have, you know, one or two spots still available. Um, if someone's interested, they can email me at bracketville.hoops at gmail.com. Right. And uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, that sounds, sounds like fun. It really does. When the bracket comes out, how close are you? Over the years, um, I've been very fortunate. Mm -hmm. um, there is a, a site, and I don't, you know, say too much about it because it's just really not not my thing. But right. there's a site called Bracket Matrix, and it tracks, you know, literally hundreds of people that do this. And I've been in the matrix now for what, thir ten years? Yeah, yeah ten years. So, um, been fortunate. Um, been ranked number one a couple of years and and we're currently at two uh -huh. for those that have been in it five years or longer my bracketville site still still up there so we've been we've been fortunate you know i like to say that because there's a certain element of luck involved in it right um but how what they do basically is it's it's a matter of how many of the 36 at larges did you get right but mm. that's please hope we don't get one wrong it's an automatic qualifier right, right? that's right um and then 
also it takes into account how closely were you to the actual seating. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's how they figure it out. But more than anything, Tim, I've met a lot of really fun people. Yeah. And from Twitter and Facebook and other things, getting to communicate with other people that do this. Right. And they're all college basketball fans. So at the end of the day, that's, that's really what makes it fun. Silly question, but and there's a purpose behind it. You'd rather be a one seed than a 16 seed. But if you had to pick a seed, what's the, the worst seed to be? I mean, again, obviously the, the obvious, but what's the worst seed and the best seed to be if you're not a one or a 16? Well, you know, that, that can vary, I guess, because it depends on year. But, you know, typically you'll hear people say we want to avoid the 8-9 game. Sure. Okay, and the reason for that is if you have a 16-team region, the 8-9 game gets to play the number one seed in game two. So if you, if you win your game, one, you're going to have a very tough opening game because you're probably pretty evenly matched. Right. And then, two, you get to – play a one seed you know in your first weekend so that makes advancing a little bit tougher sure you know so that's probably the one you don't want to be now historically a 12 seed beats a five seed almost every year uh-huh right um and what that really goes to show you is there's a lot of parity in college basketball particularly in the last decade or so and so there's not as much difference between some of these teams particularly you get them on a neutral floor and some of these 11 or 12 seeds are actually pretty good basketball teams. They just maybe don't come from a power conference or they're a power conference team that struggled, but they can be very good. And right. if you catch them on a good day. Um, so historically, being a five can be a risky business. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes, you know, every year your right. people are filling out their office pools and they're looking for that. 12, who's the 12 over five this year? Right, right. So, you know, that's kind of for whatever reason, it just that and some fours and 13s. Yeah are probably the more danger zones if you are if, if you're for your first round opponent if you had to show your bracket right now number one seeds number one seeds heading into this morning you would have virginia in the east uh, gonzaga in the west duke in the south and kentucky in the midwest um, and of course the, the interesting part about that and then you got michigan and michigan state still in play tennessee still in play and so actually kentucky and tennessee play again today sure Duke and North Carolina, who's also in play, there's about eight teams in play for a one seed, play each other again next weekend. Right. And Michigan and Michigan State play each other again. Right. So this is kind of far from decided, plus we have the conference tournaments. Right. So, but my guess is from those eight, that's where your number one seeds are going to come from. You know, in Duke right now, the world's kind of waiting on, well, what's going to happen with Zion Williamson? Right. Is he going to be able to come back and play? Yeah. Is he not? How's he going to look? And that you know, we saw years ago Cincinnati was going to be a one seed. Kenyon Martin got hurt in the conference tournament, and they ended up being a two. So, you know, they weren't – figured they weren't the same team right. with him there. So we'll see how that plays out. You know, let's just, just use Kentucky and Tennessee because I know a lot of focus on that. Kentucky beat Tennessee pretty handily a couple of weeks ago. Let's just say Tennessee wins today. Does that change the number one seed? kind of depends on what else happens around them too uh -huh. um you know on my seed list right now north carolina is in the five spot so if they win a big game you know they're right on that cusp of being a, a fourth number one seed you know and i think sometimes fans in particular get a little more caught up into the head-to-head -head results than sure. the committee does right the reality is they're just a result mm -hmm. now if you're comparing two teams and their resumes are basically even, and one team beat the other twice, the two team, the team that won twice is going to get, right. justifiably so, a slight edge. Mm -hmm. But in the terms of an overall profile, that those two games are two games of 30, mm -hmm. some that they will have played. Right. So sometimes I know it matters more to fans, and, and nobody wants to go down that road, believe me, of the A beat B and B beat C, so C's better, you know, so yeah. be, because the reality is nobody wants to say, well, so that makes you behind the team, the worst team that you lost to? No, so, you know, so that you can't look at it that way. Right. You have to look at the team's overall profile. And you mentioned the bubble earlier, and I know we don't have a lot of time left, but, you know, this year people say, is it worse? Well, it kind of looks that way, but it's really more slim is what I would say. Mm -hmm. And what I, what I mean by that is we have a lot of teams that have some really good wins, but they have so many losses. Right. 
you know, and there was a lot of Indiana fans right, you know, around yeah. here. Well, they had some really good early wins, but they've really struggled in the Big Ten, and they're at even 14 and 14. Right. Historically, the, the only, there's only been two teams that have ever gotten in with 15 losses. Mm -hmm. and they've been in recent years, but they were both, I believe, 19 and 15. Right. So there's work to be done, mm -hmm. even though they have some big wins. So we have a lot of teams that could still work their way back into that conversation because there's big wins available. Right. And every year is different. Mm -hmm. So we'll see how it plays out. But, you know, right now there's some teams that you would look at and say, well, I'm not sure they should be on the bubble. And quite right. frankly, I'm not sure they should either. But right. there's going to be 36 at-large teams, yep. and right, right now they're sitting there. Well, and I think you mentioned it earlier, a big win in November or December is it as important as a big win in late February or March. Yes. Yes. You and I don't always think that way. Right. But the reality is it still matters because it's the sum of the whole. Right and not an individual because they've taken out the metric of the last 10 games and believe it or not I'm not necessarily a fan of this per se but conference record isn't an actual criteria anymore yeah so you know it used to be that how you did in your own conference sort of was a hierarchy right but now we've gone to these super conferences and teams are playing 20 games it, you know it's kind of it's changed a little bit over the years so I'm not saying it doesn't matter but not to the extent that it used to. So you might see a team like Oklahoma, who's you know five games under 500 in their conference, but they have a lot of decent wins throughout the year who might still right. get in. Now they're going to have to win a few more games to, right. to sustain their spot, but in years past it'd be like, well, you're really not even in the ballpark. The NCAA Selection Committee, they'll meet in Indianapolis, right? Is that right? I know they used to do that. Right. I need to go back and double check that, Tim. I, I believe that they're still there, but they may have. Um, sometimes they have moved to some different spots. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They, they may actually be in New York. Oh, but I'll have to verify that for and you. They so will I be, apologize. That's all right. They will be together beginning. Starting, they will come together starting next Wednesday, mm -hmm. I believe. Usually they'll come in on Tuesday night. Mm -hmm. They will start meeting turning those first ballots Tuesday night or Wednesday morning, and right. then they will begin the process of counting us down. Let's actually take that back. It'll be a week from Wednesday. Okay. A week from Wednesday because championship week starts a week from today. Sure. And so they would be convened the Wednesday after that. So it'll right. be a week from Wednesday that they'll be getting together. But, again, this process is for the selection of the, the 64 slash 68 teams has started long before now. But when they get together, it's it's all kinds of brainstorming. All sorts of brainstorming, and they'll have some more heavy debates uh -huh. from who are some of the final teams in. And then there's a lot of debating on the seed list because ultimately that defines how the bracket goes together, right. knowing that there's also a lot of other principles and rules in play. People sometimes wonder real quick if we have a second, you know, well, why would they be in the Midwest or the West? That, that doesn't make any sense. Well, they have to one. They have to balance the bracket to the best that they can. You don't want right. one region having the top seed and each seed one, two, three, and four all in the same bracket. Sure. Two, there's rules in place. Like if you have four teams from a conference, all that are top four seeds, they all have to be in a separate region. Mm -hmm. So the first four teams. So this is, for example, like Kentucky and Tennessee will not be in the same region. Right. So if one of them ends up being a number one in the South, mm -hmm. the other one will not be in the South region. Right. They will have to go to the Midwest or the West or the East, depending on how the other factors play out. You know, like right now we have Duke and Virginia's number ones, both are in the ACC. Well, that means like North Carolina can't be in either one of their regions. Right. So it gets, a, you know, that's what's fun for these people we'll learn next week when you're putting the bracket together. Yeah. It doesn't always just go, well, they're in the East, so let's put them there. It right. doesn't doesn't work that way if uh, I need help trying to figure out what to do with my bracket where can I go for help well don't ask me to help pick games for you because <laughs> I will say this I'm better at, at the part of figuring out who's going to be in there uh -huh. once we toss them up yeah I'm just I'm just like the next guy I might have a good year I might have a bad year yeah. so I'll give you an opinion, yeah. but, you know, flip a coin and sure. take that for what it's worth. I, uh, it, it's difficult, and I, I hear this all the time from, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know anything about brackets, so uh, I, I, just, I just put in names for, for teams that sounds good. And, and, you know, sometimes it's potluck, and sometimes those kind of situations, you know, really come out too bad. Well, 
and there, I guess there's different strategies. Sure. You know, so some people are kind of like, I'm going to take the chalk approach mm -hmm. because I'm more likely to survive longer and put myself in a position to win. Right. One region, it seems, every year blows up. Mm -hmm. You know, good luck trying to figure out which one that is because it's usually the one that you don't think will. Right. You know, the one that seems the most stable mm -hmm. is usually the one that ends up happening to. Right. So, you know, if you want to try to win a big pool, you got to take some chances. Right. Well, if you the, want to try to be there in the other the five and twelve. Yes. You know. And which one do you pick? That's right. That's right. And then there's the people that pick them all and then go, I got that one. <laughs> that's exactly right. Well, if you pick them all, I'm not sure you got that one. No, that's that, all right. That, well, at least you got that one anyway. Absolutely. Dave, our time is up. We appreciate you coming in this morning. And uh, I know you're going to keep an eye on what's going on in the NCAA men's basketball regular season and tournament coming up. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, people want to follow along, they can go to bracketville.wordpress.com. That's mm -hmm. the website. Okay. Uh, if you're on Twitter, it's Bracket Guy Dave, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of corny, but it's fun. So, yeah. Anyway, yeah. uh, enjoy uh, enjoy the ride, and uh, thanks for having me. It's fun. It is fun, indeed. Thanks to Dave Allman for stopping in this morning. We appreciate it, talking about NCAA men's basketball. Again, the tournament coming up in just a few weeks. Again, uh, it's, it's going to be fun. And, again, Dave, with a lot of great insight, we appreciate him coming in. We'll do it again next Saturday morning, live from McDonald's here on Madison's Hilltop. For Jordan Baird, Dave Allman, I'm Tim Torrance. Thanks for tuning in here on Works 96.7.